Welcome to the Lead Branch Capacity Working Group meeting. We're talking today about the appropriations process, legislative capacity, and some semblance of regular order, hopefully. Uh, with us today, we have a joint venture, as you, if you don't know. I'm with Our Street Institute. Lee Drutman, the co-founder of Ledge Branches with New America, joint venture talking about congressional capacity, how we can affect some sort of change, hopefully, in the legislative congressional processes. Today, we, I'm Casey, by the way, Casey Bergen. Uh, I work with R Street, as I said, talking about issues of congressional capacity, uh, focus on the House and stuff like that. So, with us today, we have from Grinnell, Iowa College, Peter Hansen. He brought a, an official PowerPoint. I went over it before this. It is intense, so get your brains ready. And then my colleague, James Walner, is probably going to do a little more free-flowing style, but he's going to be well-educated on the appropriations process. So turn it over to these guys. Great. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and stand up. Um, I just want to thank all of you um, for inviting me out and giving me a chance to speak to the group. Um, so I'm Peter Hansen, I'm a professor at Grinnell College. I know there are some Grinnellians in the audience, so thanks for coming. Um, I have a, uh, so my background is I, I spent some time on the Hill. I was here for six years um, back in the late 90s and early 2000s um, working over on the Senate side. And one of my responsibilities was appropriations and I, I became very interested in the process. And um, so when I left the Hill, I decided that I would pursue that in my research. And so. Uh, in my studies in graduate school. Um, I focused on the annual appropriations process. I studied about a 40-year time period, uh, looking at the, the passage of bills, trying really to understand why regular order and appropriations broke down starting in the 80s, why we moved toward this uh, uh, process of packaging uh, the, uh, the appropriations bills into omnibus bills. Um, and I uh, wrote my dissertation on that, ended up writing a book on that. And now what I'm doing is really sort of spinning off that and trying to, um, to ask a different set of questions uh, about legislative process in the House. So uh, the project I'm presenting to you today uh, comes from a paper that Lee and I have been working on for some time. And uh, it is trying to understand first, what do people mean when they call for a restoration of regular order? And should we be able to wave our magic wands and, and have a return to regular order in Congress, what would that even look like? Um, does it, would it produce the kind of results that, that I think people hope we would produce? Uh, so what I'm gonna walk you through today, I'm, I'm gonna try and define regular order for you, at least as, it's being, as the term is being used by members and practitioners. Um, then I'm gonna present some data from the project that Lee and I have been working on, we collected 10 years worth of data on amendments to appropriations bills. We can look at patterns and how many passed and how many failed and whether the majority minority offered them and we can draw some, some conclusions based on that. Um, so, uh, so we were joking that uh, the technology is working remarkably smoothly and already I see this slide looks funny. So we'll just go along and see what happens. Um, so, one consistent theme we're hearing from both practitioners of Congress and scholars who study Congress is that we would like to improve deliberation. There's been a concern that Congress's ability to deliberate on legislation has declined, both in terms of bringing in and relying on outside expertise, having experts write legislation, and uh, produce ultimately effective policy solutions to the kind of problems we have. Um, scholars would describe legislating in Congress right now as, as having two apparent features. One is compared to, say, the 1950s and 60s, a, a centralization of power in places like leadership and, and power has been taken away from committees. Uh, there is more restrictive approaches being taken on the floor to legislating. Uh, and second, there's a term that's broadly used to describe legislating today called unorthodox lawmaking, which is that there's no set way a bill becomes law anymore. It used to be that you went from committee to the floor uh, to conference, and now we see a lot of ad hoc approaches, uh, not one set way that bills become a law. And the main criticism of this is, is that this kind of ad hoc method lacks deliberation. It lacks an effective way uh, to write legislation. And so we're not getting the best ideas, we're not scrutinizing, scrutinizing bills. And in response to that, we've heard calls to return to regular order. And they're coming from all kinds of different directions. They're coming from scholars uh, like uh, Thomas Mann and Norm Ornstein. They're coming from members themselves. 
And one of the confusing things about this is I think everybody means something a little different. Um, and so I want to try and talk about that and, and distill what I think folks are actually talking about. Uh, so this is Don Wolfensberger. He uh, used to be staff director of House Rules. Uh, here's his definition. The regular order can be defined as those rules, precedents, and customs of Congress that constitute an orderly and deliberative policymaking process. This includes an objective assessment of the problem through inclusive information gathering, a balanced weighing of alternative solutions, and a coming to final judgment on a solution through robust debate among all parties. So you can see a lot of elements there. It's, it's bipartisan, there's open debate, there are opportunities to bring new ideas uh, to bear, but it's also, uh, there's sort of a set process. It's deliberative, um, it's orderly. Uh, we can look at what members themselves say. Here's uh, Rick Nolan of Minnesota. The fact is we need to return to and restore regular order where every bill is brought to the floor of the House. Brought to the floor of the House is required to be considered by committee with open rules where every amendment, every idea is debated, voted on, and fully considered. Uh, Steve King, other side of the spectrum, All right? Uh, when this Congress is set up to function accurately, when we are defending, protecting, and respecting the jurisdiction of the various committees, we get the best product because we have the people on committees that have, at least in theory, the most knowledge about the topic that comes before the committee. So as I looked at these kind of statements over and over again, just trying to figure out what do people mean? Let's get away from particular parliamentary definitions of regular order. What are they really calling for? Uh, what I hear them calling for is a return to a more decentralized system of legislating in Congress, a return to strong committees, uh, and also a return to the use of open amendments on the floor uh, in the House where, uh, as all of you know, they have um, become very, very scarce in recent years. Um, so those two elements, that's what, when I try and define what, are, what people talk about when they say regular order, stronger, more independent committees, and more open amending on the House floor. This is a return to what we would call the textbook Congress of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, moving from our centralized system of legislating today to a more decentralized system. In my mind, this raises two big issues. One is, why would members do this? Right, what's their incentive to do this? Political scientists think of members of Congress as being strategic actors who pursue their interests uh, as they see them. Um, well, really, what people are calling for when they're calling for regular order is a decentralization of power. That's why the members we hear calling from it tend to be on the outs, right? They're on the outside looking in. They're members of the minority. They're disenfranchised members of the majority who might be at odds with their leadership. They are people who want to share in uh, the power of legislating. Um, so one question we'd have to ask is, I mean, it's, it's understandable that they want this, but is this something that most members would go along with, particularly most members of the majority? Is it in their interest? Um, the evidence I'm going to present today suggests they might think it's not in their interest. They might have perfectly good reasons for, for staying away from it. Not that that leads to great legislating, but they're actually pursuing their interests as they understand them. Um, second, this system of legislating that folks want to return to, decentralized legislating with strong independent committees uh, and open rules on the floor. Well, that comes from the 1950s and 60s when the parties were uh, ideologically diverse. They overlapped with each other. There were Democrats who were more conservative than Republicans. There were Republicans who were more conservative than Democrats. This, of course, was a result of the division of the Democratic Party uh, between Northern liberals and Southern <coughs> segregationists, right? So there were really particular historical circumstances that led to the parties overlapping with each other and that led members to oppose having strong leaders because conservative southern chairs didn't want to have anyone telling them how to legislate. So that whole uh, system of interest that underlied, um, that, that, that stood under that system of legislating, that's gone, right? And, and good riddance to it. Right? So uh, members in those days were pursuing their interests as they saw fit. And members today are doing the same thing with a different, uh, different kind of result. The second thing we have to think about is, all right, if we got regular order back, we waved our magic wand, would it constitute deliberation as, as we're thinking about it? Well, uh, I don't talk about committees in this research. I actually think committees are, are great places for deliberation. Um, what I'm interested in is what happens uh, when bills are brought to the floor under open rules, under highly polarized conditions like we have today. Does that constitute deliberation? And would that improve legislation? And I think there are two sides to this debate we have to think about. Um, the first is that sometimes people talk about an open, open amending process as a kind of perfecting process. Right? You bring a bill to the floor, people come to the floor, they offer their ideas, amendments that are beneficial, 
uh, get adopted. You know, through that kind of tinkering, legislation improves. Alternatively, we could see a different kind of process. You bring a bill to the floor. The partisan bomb throwers come out. Right? They start offering their poison pills. And eventually, so many politically painful votes pile up that the bill just sinks under its own weight. So maybe actually open amending is not a good way to pass legislation. Maybe it's just going to cause more problems. So we're going to try and shed some light on which of these two alternatives we see. Uh, the data I'm presenting is uh, basically 10 years uh, of amending data on appropriations bills. Every individual bill that came to the floor, we collected all the amendments on it. We looked uh, to saw what got a vote, what passed, uh, who it was sponsored by, and we looked for patterns in them. Uh, as all of you know, most bills come to the floor uh, under closed rules today. Appropriations bills have generally been an exception to that process. That's eroded now in the last few years. Uh, they used to come to the floor under open rules or with no rule. Um, you know, uh, there were also instances in which you, uh, amendments had to be pre-printed in the record, but it was still a pretty free-flowing process relative to every other kind of legislating you see in the House. Um, so we're able to witness, then, what happens in highly polarized conditions like we have today under an open amendment process. Um, that said, we do it with a kind of caveat. Appropriations bills are historically bipartisan. They're generally regarded as must-pass bills. Um, so this is a category of legislation in which if, if there's anything that people generally want to um, have a productive debate on it, you know, obviously there's fights on appropriations bills, but there's also lots of them that just have gone through the process pretty easily. This is a good place to observe productive legislating if it's going to take place. So I'll present data from that in two case studies. Um, let me just quickly tell you what we're going to see here before I, I present a bunch of scary looking charts. Uh, the first, uh, first thing is that I see patterns that are both, that are consistent with both legislating that looks like it's, it's aimed at improving the bill, productive legislating in which both sides are, are just engaged in sort of a goodwill debate, um, and of uh, legislating that is members position taking, offering poison pills designed to hurt the other side. Uh, bottom line is, is that regular order is just a double-edged sword. If you bring bills to the floor under an open rule, you open the door to both kinds of legislating. Uh, and I think what we've seen from leaders is an unwillingness to take the risk that that poses. So they've pulled back um, and they've been unwilling to, to bring uh, bills to the floor under conditions of open debate. Um, so let me just jump into the data. Uh, we can look and see what it says and, and then we can get into a broader discussion. Um, first, so does regular order allow amendments from all sides to be offered, considered, and adopted? Uh, the answer is clearly yes. Right? So uh, regular order is great for the minority. So the chart I have up for you is the 109th through the 113th Congresses. It tells you which party was in control. And those bars just represent counts of amendments. Right? So the number of amendments offered, um, the number voted on, and the number approved. And what I want to draw your attention to is just the robust amount of legislating taking place and just compare the minority bars to the majority bars. Right? The minority does well. Right? They're not in power. They're still offering amendments. Their amendments are getting voted on. And those amendments are getting passed. Uh, the 100, 111th Congress is an outlier here. And that's because Democrats cracked down with structured rules. Um, and a lot of bills didn't come to the floor. And so uh, amending as a whole declined in that Congress. Um, but during this entire time period, a minority uh, legislators sponsored 54% of amendments and 43% of adopted amendments. They're doing really well. They're having a big effect on the output of bills. Now, these data don't tell us what the content there was. I mean, I can't tell you, you know, were these poison pills or not, were these uh, productive amendments or not. But it, at least I can, I can tell you that um, you know, the question is, does everybody have a chance to participate? The answer is clearly yes. All right, this is the, I think, second scariest graph I show you. So let me um, spend some time explaining what it is. Uh, this is 109th through the 113th Congresses. Every dot represents a successful amendment, one that was passed. The vertical axis is the percentage of the minority party voting for it. The horizontal axis is the percentage of the majority party voting for it. Uh, majority amendments are colored in blue. Minority amendments are colored in that reddish-orange. 
here's some interesting patterns I want to point out to you. Every amendment in this upper left quadrant, each one of those Congresses, um, that's an amendment that passes um, with over 50% support from the minority party and under 50% support from the majority party. This is the majority party getting rolled on the floor. Most members of their party oppose this bill, but it passes anyway. Right, so all of this legislating up in this corner, again, that's not just the minority party winning, right? That's the minority party rolling the majority. Um, everything in the upper right corner, those are amendments that pass with bipartisan support. Everything down in the lower right, uh, those are amendments that pass mostly with majority support. So there's several interesting patterns here. <coughs> One is what happens when you allow open rules on the floor? Well, first you open the door uh, to a lot of successful minority party legislative activity. And the majority party opens itself up to being rolled. So they have to be willing to accept some policy losses. Um, you also open the door to a lot of bipartisan cooperation. Obviously, none of those minority party amendments pass without some support from the majority. So they're winning some majority votes. Um, also, note the change over time. Right? We've gone from a situation where in the 109th and 110th, we had a lot of um, successful Democratic amendments, or I should say successful minority amendments, because control switches. And as we shift down to the recent Congresses, that has lessened, and we've seen a lot more legislative activity by the majority than pushing through uh, amendments solely on majority party support. So notice how the concentration of amendments has increased down here. So there's just a lot of interesting features to deal with there. You know, um, if we think about, tell me, if, sorry. If the, uh, if the uh, chairman simply accepts the amendment, is that shown in that? It has to be a vote. These are all roll call votes. Yeah. Um, one more sort of interesting point to make. You might say, well, what, what would the majority's incentive be for, for engaging in that kind of open debate? Well, one incentive might be their members get to act as entrepreneurs. Right? They get to go out, offer their amendments, and they get to try and win minority votes to help them pass. These are all majority party amendments offered during that time period. Um, and the red line is a uh, tipping point to, to win the vote. Right? So only about half of majority par party amendments could have won on majority votes only. Right? So part of the, the philosophy of having open rules, and I think one of the, the incentives that majority party members have had, is they can go out there, they can offer their amendment, they can be entrepreneurial, they can go build a coalition with minority party voters, um, and a lot of those amendments are successful. Right? So those are, there are some amendments passing with support from both parties. Uh, so finally, these are all adopted amendments, everything that actually passed, at least the initial House floor. I'm not looking at what came out of conference here, but what came off the floor. Um, if you look at everything that passed, most things are passing by voice. Um, the darker gray are amendments where there were successful roll call votes where both parties supported them. Lighter gray is amendments where there were successful roll call votes where the minority, more than half of the minority voted for it and less than half the majority. And then the white is a roll call votes where the majority dominated. But this is pretty successful minority party legislating here, I would say. So what are my takeaways from this? Well, does regular order provide an opportunity for a kind of perfecting process? I mean, I, I don't have the kind of granular data I'd need to answer that. I can't look at the quality of bills and tell you they improve. But there's certainly a lot of legislative activity by both sides that's consistent with that kind of philosophy. Um, both parties offer and win passage of amendments. There's a lot of different coalition types, everything ranging from majority-dominated coalitions to minority-dominated coalitions. Um, and lots of opportunities for individual members to be successful. Uh, so one of our takeaways here is I, I think if you allow regular order, you allow open amending, um, the majority has to release some control. There's a cost to it to them. It's not just um, that they're going to engage in deliberative lawmaking. They're going to lose some fights. Um, they're going to lose some policy fights. And so the question you have to ask is, will members find this in their interest? All right, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock here. All right, so these are the... Um, this, these next two charts I show you address a second question, or address a second question, and that is, uh, 
are, are members out there using this open process to offer poison pills amendments, just to, to, to grandstand and embarrass the other party, maybe embarrass their own members. Um, you know, some, uh, some extreme member of the majority party who, who's, uh, who wants to embarrass leadership. Uh, our evidence suggests that there's a lot of that kind of activity that goes along with this as well. So uh, these red and blue lines are, are just fitted lines to, to the dots. Each dot represents um, an amendment that was offered. And the basic takeaway point here, so uh, as the scale, the vertical scale indicates the number of amendments that were offered and the uh, horizontal scale is an ideological score. So actually this is, each dot represents a member and the number of amendments they offered. Um, the takeaway point here is notice the graph, the lines go up uh, in each direction, especially particularly on the Republican side. One of the things we've learned from this essentially is that as the ideological, ideological extremity, particularly of Rep Republican members increases, they offer a lot more amendments. Right? Our takeaway point then is that when you open the floor to debate, you get a lot of legislating by more ideologically extreme members of Congress and probably uh, amendments <coughs> that are designed to embarrass the other side or perhaps embarrass their own members. That pattern is a little less distinct on the Democratic side. We see it in some places, but not in others. But it's pretty consistent on the Republican side. Um, this next graph shows us the percentage of, or rather the, the proportion of same party support won for an amendment by the um, uh, by the sponsor of that amendment. So essentially, if you are a Democrat and you offered amendment an amendment on the floor, um, what percentage of your own party voted with you? And so this is the percent of same party support or the proportion on the vertical axis, and this is the ideological score, again, of members of Congress. And one of the interesting things we noted is that as members become more extreme, support tends to go down. So, and the pattern's not quite as clear there, but we see it in a lot of places. Right? What that means is those more ideologically extreme members who are offering a lot of amendments, they're also not winning support even from their own party. That suggests that these amendments are, are designed for press releases, position taking, maybe embarrassing other members. This is not what we would define as productive legislating. So, do we see a perfecting process or poison pills? Uh, we see evidence of both. I mean, I think the patterns here are, are consistent with both kinds of legislating. Um, regular order clearly opens the door to productive legislating and more, um, more activity from uh, ideological extremists. So it's a double-edged sword. That is the fundamental challenge that leaders have. Let me just share a couple of case studies with you uh, and then I'll conclude and we can open for comments and questions. Um, 2005, uh, another period like today, unified Republican control of government. Um, this is a nice example of productive legislating taking place under unified control of government with the minority party having a really sort of active, productive role. Uh, in this case, all 12 appropriations bills were considered under an open rule and, and approved on the House floor. That's now a rarity, of course. Democrats offered more amendments than Republicans. They were in the minority. 40% uh, of them almost were approved. Republicans only did slightly better. They offered 106 amendments, but 41% were adopted. Um, so Democrats had a really good track record in this Congress. And I looked particularly at the Transportation Treasury Bill, and there were some just really interesting patterns. So the Bush administration had a, an initiative to take money away from Amtrak. That was defeated. Um, it was defeated by a Democratic coalition with some Republicans joining them. Um, there are also Republican successes. There was a success on gun control. So there's some wins and losses here for the majority party. Um, and, but, uh, but that bill went on, the Treasury, tr Transportation Treasury bill went on to pass 405 to 18. Right? So you can contrast that with what happened a year ago. Uh, you'll re probably recall this debate. Uh, so there was a skirmish on an Obama era executive order designed to protect gays and lesbians from discrimination in the federal workforce. Uh, it started on the defense authorization bill, as I recall, and then spilled over into appropriations. And it first went on to the Milcon bill, and then it went on to energy and water. So Democrats offered an, an amendment to basically preserve this executive order 
on the energy and water bill. Uh, it passed narrowly, uh, but then Democrats didn't vote for the bill anyway, and about half of Republicans ended up voting no. Um, and so the, the bill ended up sinking, and the blame was pointed at uh, this amendment um, for having injected uh, partisan politics into appropriations. So we see two kinds of patterns here then. Right? Amending activity, uh, which actually strengthens bipartisan coalitions, and amending activity, uh, which takes a bill that was viewed as likely to pass and then injects a new issue in that, uh, that uh, disrupts the coalition of support for that bill. <coughs> So our, our key takeaway point here then, again, for those calling for regular order, recognize what, what you're calling for is a double-edged sword. Uh, it is not simply opening the door to productive debate. It's decentralizing power, right? And in particular, it's opening the door to minority party legislative activity that might not be in the majority's interest, which is why I think they don't do it. Um, and uh, let's see if there's any other point I wanted to make. So uh, let me just stop there. Uh, so again, One final point I want to make. I think folks look at regular order at the system we used to have of decentralized committees and open floor debate, and they, they look at models of the past when this worked really, really well. And I think the most important takeaway point we have to have is it worked well in an era in which the parties were not polarized, in which Democrats overlapped with Republicans, and when you had committee chairs who didn't want to be subject to strong majority party control. Uh, we're in a different era now, and so we can't simply import uh, a style of legislating that worked well then and expect it to work the same way now. Uh, when we try to do that now, we get results that look like what we've showed you today. Um, so it's a much more complicated kind of picture. All right, let me stop there and uh, get some comments and we can take some questions. Um, good afternoon, my name's James. I, uh, can everybody hear me? Can you see me? Do you want me to stand up? Okay. Um, I enjoyed the paper a lot. Um, I thought it was a good paper. I think it raises a lot of interesting issues and it, and it emphasizes a lot of things that we really are grappling with today. And I think the, the first thing is, and the most important to me that like kind of leapt off the page was how it emphasized the trade-off between deliberation and this concept of regular order, right? And they're not necessarily the one and the same, potentially. Um, there is an argument that kind of irregular order is now regular, right? But there is, there is a tension there. And I think that really requires us to define what we mean by deliberation. And for many, deliberation simply means more debate. Right? If you have a debate, that's deliberation. But in the context here, deliberation, it seems, is legislative deliberation, which means that you are um, you're engaging in a process whereby you consider alternatives and you vote on them. Right? And so, from that definition, any restriction on a member's ability to participate in that process is a restriction on their ability to deliberate, right? And this is a, a tricky thing because we oftentimes will talk about poison pill amendments, but it's not entirely clear who gets to decide what is and is not a poison pill amendment, right? And if the majority is, is given the power to decide, or if that's the expectation, oftentimes you'll see that they go very far, right? And then you'll get into arguments about, well, this isn't a poison pill amendment. And this definition of deliberation really doesn't leave a lot of room for um, restrictions on members' ability to participate in that process. You're going to sacrifice deliberation if you begin to place restrictions on what members can and can't do. It's not necessarily a bad thing. The appropriations process in the House and in the Senate have lots of rules that restricts what can be included. So you can have restrictions, but there is a trade-off. And every time you do put restrictions on, you're restricting deliberation. Um, but I think th this trade-off is very interesting and in, in, in discussing deliberation in the context of regular order is very interesting because of this notion of regular order is the schoolhouse rock how a bill becomes a law, right? Like we all know what that is. Well, a bill doesn't always become a law, right? And so once you recognize the trade-off between deliberation and regular order, you begin to see that sometimes Bills don't pass, right? And, that, and I think trying to figure out how we grapple with this problem right now in Congress um, of not enough deliberation, I think first and foremost requires us to be okay with that when that does in fact happen. Because the process is telling us something. And it's telling us that there's not an agreement on that particular issue at that particular point in time. There may be next week, there may be next month, or after the next election, 
it's a little bit more complicated with appropriations bills if we, if we discussed, but it, it does tell you that. And sometimes you can't get an agreement and a stalemate or gridlock is necessary to kind of key in people on the outside that something important is at stake. And so that society can grapple with this issue and then ultimately resolve it um, sooner rather than later most of the time. But I do think that regular order, and Peter makes this point in the paper, does produce, or deliberation, does produce better outcomes, right? It does produce bills that are generally better, right, than something that's written in secret somewhere. The adversarial process does improve quality, in my opinion, because when you have a product and you put it out there and you've got to defend it and justify it and, 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 and argue about it, well, guess what? You're going to quickly find the flaws because the other side's going to point them out. But if you have a bill that you wrote in secret, it's going to be a lot harder to figure out where you messed up. It's just like when you write a paper and you give it to somebody to read and it comes back and it's got red marks all over the place, right? That's a good thing. Um, failure is a good thing because it allows you to improve the final product. Um, but even when, even setting that aside, it's still a better outcome because you get stable outcomes out of a deliberative process. When you see your claims adjudicated on the floor, either as a member of the other party or a dissenting member of your own party or an interest group on the outside that was opposed to a particular provision in the bill, you are okay with that in the sense that you're not going to constantly see it as an illegitimate outcome, right? Because there's a process here, and this is the essence of our kind of system that we have. But when there is irregular order, you can't see your claims being adjudicated. You have no idea where this debate is playing out. And it's very difficult to socialize oneself to the outcome when the outcome is something that you oppose very deeply. Right? And so the act of legislating is just as important as, as the actual legislation in many respects because it allows for the losers to be okay with the outcome. And not okay, I'm like, oh, well, we love this, but to be okay with it. In the same way that like the legislative, you know, I don't know of many Republicans these days who say, well, we really don't like Social Security, right? Or we really don't like the Civil Rights Act. Or we really don't like, um, you know, Medicare, those types of things. And these are all big contentious issues at the time that were debated very, very vigorously, right? I guess it would have been reversed in many of those, like the Social, Civil Rights Act. But because there was a process and you had your say and you went through it and then the parties kind of made their peace with it. Society changed and positions changed and, and here we are today. But how you legislate and the act of legislating is very important. So I guess the, the next question I would just say just to kind of frame these comments and these questions is how do we get more deliberation then, right? Because if it's a good thing, well, how do we get it? Well, I, it seems to me that you, you can open up the process, but there are trade-offs to that. And before you can grapple with those trade-offs, you have to figure out what you want out of the process. And this is something that is very frustrating to me, and it's something that is missing from any discussion about how do we reform the process to make appropriations work. <coughs> well, what do we want? Right? There's nothing magical about 12 bills. It's not like Moses came down from Mount Sinai and he's got 12 bills. If you read Roman history, you know about the 12 tablets of Rome, right? You know the 12 tables? You know, they're carved on bronze, right? Well, that's what you think about these 12 bills. Like, oh my God, we got to have 12 bills every year. Okay. Generally speaking, I, you know, I tend to like doing what's been done before. It seems like it works. You know where it's going. But that may not be the only way. Maybe we need 50 bills. Maybe we need four bills. Maybe we need one big bill on the floor for six months, right? I don't know what that is, but there is recognizing the trade-off between you know, the kind of conflict in the environment and deliberation allows you to prioritize what your outcomes are. And until we grapple with how we want the legislative process and the appropriations process to work, it's gonna be very difficult to, to have rules and reforms that make it work better. Because I'm not sure we know what that is, and it's not necessarily passing more bills. Right? Um, so that, that's, that's one thing. And then the last thing I would say is that this is, I think, a very interesting topic because for those of us who are interested in, in congressional reform, we talk about capacity a lot. Right? That's obviously the purpose of this group. And it's a good thing, and we should talk about it. And a lot of that does draw our focus to the committee level, which is also a good thing. We have committees for a reason. It's a division of labor. But there is still a thorny issue out there which is when you have a very contentious environment, and you saw this before in the 50s and the 60s, when you have a very contentious environment and people expect their representatives to get involved in that environment, the committees aren't gonna solve the problem because the members, the full chamber wants to get involved. 
particularly in the Senate, but also in the House. And so you have to figure out a way of dealing with that and how do you grapple with it? And is it informal? Is it tapping heads of the various informal caucuses to try to get a broad-based agreement before a concept goes into the committee process, which is how they did it at the beginning of the Republic, right? You would kind of debate an issue and then you would form a committee and then you would send it on its way. Um, it's how the Constitutional Convention worked, obviously. Give it some direction. I don't know what that answer is, but we have to at least acknowledge that giving committees more deference in the process and giving them more resources necessarily won't solve all the problems because committees can't solve all the problems. And we have legislatures here that are full of members who are sent here to be involved. And guess what? If you vote for someone and Social Security is at stake, you're going to want that person to have a say in the outcome, even if they're on the Ag Committee, right? Like, that's just the nature of the business. So you have to figure out how to deal with that. And I think appropriations um, is, is, a, is a great example of that. Because at the end of the day, regular order, as I see it, is, you know, how do you have, what is the moment for that snapshot in time? How do you deal with the conflict in your environment in the most deliberative way possible, right? That's the way I typically think of regular order. And the regular order of the 50s and 60s, in early 60s, it wouldn't work today, right? But that doesn't mean that you can't have a deliberative process that does, that is orderly, that does generally more times than not produce outcomes that are consistent with bills passing, quality bills, people have their say. So I think we need to think more creatively about, you know, outside the box here about how do we fix the problems we have in a way to get at this underlying issue of the fact that there's just literally no deliberation. And in fact, many times today, the only time you get a say is if you're, if everyone's convinced that you're not going to win. And if you do win, they pull the bill or they block your amendment. And that's not deliberation. That's just fundamentally not uh, consistent with the deliberative process. And so those are the kind of things I think we all need to grapple with in this group. And then again, <coughs> do we need 150 appropriations bills? Do you do appropriations bills every other year? I don't know the answers to these questions, but I do know that we haven't really grappled with and the members haven't really grappled with what do we mean by a good appropriations process. So with that, I would open it up for... Yeah, right. well, now we open it up to the crowd. Uh, we have a lot of, a lot of Congress uh, nerds here who have questions, I'm sure. Uh, introduce yourself. Thank you so much. This uh, was great. My name is Laura Kelly. I'm at Georgetown. Excuse me. I uh, look at ways to decentralize Congress sort of, uh, all the time in my job at the Beck Center, which is a social impact and innovation lab. So group, uh, one of the things I've been thinking about is what is an adequate, in sort of the digital era, what is an adequate substitute for uh, some of the demands on a democratic system like in transparency, there's been some interesting literature about how a real-time trusted explanation is a satisfactory surrogate for being in the room because you have all this demand for transparency. So what would be like a satisfactory substitute for deliberation when we no longer have um, maybe members uh, who desire or are skilled at it, a process that's not equipped for it, and also an environment that is this sort of 24-second uh, news cycle that also has far less, less attention in this attention economy. Um, but also these distortions in our system, one of which is sort of Citizens United, and the fundraising demands on members, or not just issue capture by outside groups, but whole process capture um, across the country uh, that are in, in, in the states as well as in Washington, D.C. So what do you think about something like iteration as a substitute for deliberation, where um, you could just make more efficient, like the language and the bills that ha have been introduced in the past there's so much that's inefficient inside Congress right now. There's so much that uh, members um, just reintroduce and reintroduce, but the system that we have here doesn't keep an institutional memory that matches like an enterprise network in the digital era. Like any outside organization that was this complex would have ways to optimize inside the system. And so there's probably ways to not only uh, allow more members to participate, but that you could decentralize and actually allow more constituents and citizens to participate. But then the question is how do you do that responsibly, that, that A, protects it from information warfare, uh, and, and B, respects the prerogative of the institution, which is actually set up pretty well to be resilient in the way that it is representative. Um, it'll never be a direct democracy, 
But there, there seems to me to be some ways that we can share sort of a new division of labor of Congress where there's parts of, of the deliberative process that aren't as contentious, like the formative engagement, like when just risk taking on ideas. Like the, the, the sadness that I think a lot of members experience is just that they have, they came here with ideas. It's not like they get them when they come here. And they have no chance because we haven't set up a structure for them to participate at home. They get attacked. Uh, it's less and less safe to even show up in public spaces to deliberate. Like that's something nobody likes to talk about. But um, it's also shut down inside the institution. So what do you think about, uh, about the benefits of sort of technology and, and data and figuring out ways to include more at scale? Um, have you looked at, at any of that right now? Because it seems we have to figure out a way for more people to participate in the process, not just members, but citizens, because the legitimacy of Congress is so at risk right now. I mean, I haven't looked at uh, at those issues specifically, but I, I do think it's a, you know, one one way to think about those kind of questions is there is a tension between um, competing values in legislating, and I think one might be transparency and, and deliberation, right? Um, so, uh, a lot of the folks who who study who study deliberation will make the argument that um, it's necessary to have some degree of secrecy. You know, it's, it's necessary to be able to meet behind closed doors and have candid discussions and, and reach agreements outside of the spotlight. Well, that is at odds with our desire for transparency and to know everything that's going on at all times and for it to be blasted out over social media. So in some ways, the, those competing values may, um, you know, I think the demand for increasing transparency may very well be one of the reasons why deliberation has become harder. Uh, because as soon as a member strays from an established position, um, that becomes broadcast everywhere. Let me, let me just say one other uh, thing about that too. I think we have to learn to recognize and appreciate deliberation where it's happening in our current system. I think we have our, a model in mind of what it should look like and it's the model uh, that I just described. Um, but it may ha be happening differently now. So for example, if the Appropriations Committee is quietly writing bills behind closed doors doing work as they've always done, and they just don't bring those to the floor. They package them up at the end of the year and you know, push them through. Um, they may write a better bill, right? In fact, there's good staff on those committees, right? So that bill may look better and be better from a policy standpoint than it would look if they brought it to the floor under open, you know, open rule that allowed all the bomb throwers to come out, right? So, and we, we haven't really thought seriously about that. I'm sure people here have, but I think as a, you know, sort of a, community of people interested in democracy, we haven't really thought seriously about which one of those paths actually gets us a better bill. Um, and um, so. I, I think we also need to look at, I think it's a great question, um, but when you think about the process, it's not just about one bill. It's the totality of the process as you change expectations. And so one of the reasons now in the House and in the Senate why you see bomb throwers or whatever you want to call it is because the expectation is not there that you will have an opportunity otherwise, right? And so what you see is it's just like this cycle that gets created where, you know, people try harder and harder to prevent things and then the other people try harder and harder to add things and it's just, and it creates this cycle and then it changes our expectations on both sides and then you get retrenchment. Whereas a more of a deliberative process, it will very quickly, I think, even out into a kind of a new norm and you will have, sure, you'll have uncomfortable amendments. There's always been uncomfortable amendments. But on average, it's going to be probably pretty easy. And look, if you get an uncomfortable amendment added to a bill that's really bad policy, that nobody likes it, and they fear the outcome, and it gets added to that bill, and it gets signed into law, well, guess what? If they were accurate and they didn't like the outcome, then people are going to realize that pretty quickly. And then in one year, they're going to change it if they don't do it before then. And then if they handle it that way, after like falling and scraping your knees if you're a kid, right? You're going to like learn that you should probably look down at the kids at home, young kids. You should look down, you're like, I'm going to look where I stop, right? But you don't, and then all of a sudden, that amendment's not going to win the next time. And the process is more consistent with a democratic kind of constitutional republic like we have versus having a bunch of people behind closed doors who I agree know their stuff. Now, this is going to be really bad. Well, guess what? Sometimes you got to let the people's representatives fail on their own, right? That's just, that's the price for having a stable system. And I think we have to come to terms with that. 
The other thing I would say is with regard to transparency, I agree that it creates uh, uncomfortable situations, but I think most of the time we have an expectation of people on either side of the, of the spectrum, if you want to think about it that way, which is that they're not going to settle for anything less. And in my experience, it seems to me that that's true when you have this process that just produces something at the end, right? And everybody says, well, we tried as hard as we could, but we couldn't do this, that, or the other. Right? But at the end of the day, they're like, well, I didn't see anything. I just see this bill. And this keeps happening over and over. So it's this new norm right, that's been created. Their expectations are, well, maybe you didn't try. Versus if you have, in the light of day, an actual messy, ugly fight on the floor right, or in a committee somewhere, but people can see it, they're gonna be, they're, you're going to get credit from those people if you're on their side for outcomes that are suboptimal. It's just gonna happen, maybe not all the time, because they're gonna say, well, look, you know, you tried your hardest and you got like 40%. It's a lot harder when you start off saying, hey, we gotta accept 30% and I know you didn't see it, but I really tried hard for more and I just couldn't get it. Like that is not gonna be a sustainable way of making policy. Uh, Lee, are you my Yeah, uh, um, you well, I'm just going to make sure. Introduce yourself. Uh, Tony McCann. I'm now at the University of Maryland. Used to be with House Appropriations Committee. Um, I, I got a question about the data, if I could. Um, if I understand it correctly, there were uh, 12 committee, 12 subcommittees over 10 years. So you had 120 opportunities for a bill to go to the floor. Mm -hmm. My guess is in that period, less than half made. And of the half, you don't have a representative sample. For example. DOD, NOCON probably made it more. Labor H, I'd be surprised if made it once. Right. And so the data is skewed in a sense, mm -hmm. and probably might be more, might be worse, if you will, than, than what you present. And the second point is, in the bills, at least the bill I dealt with, <coughs> uh, the entire bill wasn't controversial, although Labor H generally was. But, but you tend to have, you know, Labor Department, not much interest. HHS, big parts, and NIH, not so much, and so forth. It gets right through, and, and general provision. So, so you uh, you uh, uh, focus on the bill as an entity, where it's really a, com a combination of a lot of other stuff. And then the last point I would make is, um, when I went to the Hill in 95, is when the Labor H subcommittee stopped having closed markups and started open markups. And I was the new staff, and there were a lot of holdover staff. And there was no doubt among the holdover staff that the deliberative process was much better in the closed environment than it had been in the open environment. It wasn't the open environment. Uh, your, your point on the data is exactly right. Um, it, Lee and I point out in the paper that we have a selection bias uh, problem. And that is because we can only observe bills that came to the floor, the bills that came to the floor of the group that were available to come were less controversial. And so everything I'm showing you in that sense is the best case of, you know, if we take the least controversial bills and we put them on the floor, here's what happens. Um, and so we can't say that if they, they took a highly controversial bill, say Labor H came to the floor every year, what would that look like? It would probably look pretty ugly. Um, I think your, you know, your point on, um, Labor H bill moving from a, uh, a closed to open process is consistent with what a lot of political scientists argue that um, more candid conversations happen behind closed doors, deal making happens behind closed doors, and we shouldn't be so scared of it. And we treat it like it's always a bad thing. Um, we need to recognize that we need to provide environments in which compromise can take place. Uh, thank you. I'm Natalie. I'm the mediator um, with the Communities in Transition. Um, I have a comment and then a, a question. Uh, so my comment is, um, I, so I agree that uh, probably an adversarial process or debate is, is probably a step up from doing things behind um, closed door. But I'm wondering if there's a maybe a, a third way which uh, looks at deliberation not so much as debate but um, dialogue, which would um, be built on the premise of equal access to a, a process and um, talking with as opposed to talking at. So really changing the dynamics of how conversations are, 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 being, uh, are being done. So uh, my question is regarding um, the research on regular order. Um, one of the definitions included um, uh, having an assessment and inclusive data gathering. 
And so I was wondering if you found through your research that regular order improved that um, uh, assessment and that inclusive data gathering process, so I'm assuming between constituency of, of diverse opinions. Um, and if this, the outcome of using regular order then um, uh, was been matched the needs of those assessments. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I, I mean, that that would most likely happen through the committee process, right? The committees are the ones who are set up to do that, and and I don't have a good answer for you because this paper really just looked at the outcome of floor debate, um, and so we would need a separate study really looking at um, outcomes from a committee process for me to give you a good answer to that question. Is there a different model that gets us good outcomes? So, uh, James, you're talking about how you know we have 12 appropriations bills. Do we actually need 12? What happened if we had one that we put on the floor for six months? And Peter, you were talking about how we um, we don't actually really talk about the idea that, a, that maybe what's important in the deliberations, the committees doing the work, and then the part exactly how it comes to the floor is the less important part of the process. And essentially, maybe we should be okay with having one omnibus that shows up as a giant thing. So I'd be curious from both of you, what are, as people who work on these, sort of ask these kind of questions and you read them, what are, the, what are the questions we should start asking and how should we start looking at them? Um, so th that's a great question and it's one I ask myself. And, um, I think there are, are things we just don't know, right? So as political scientists, we don't have great measures of legislative quality, and so it's very difficult um, when somebody asks the question, are, well, if you, if you put 12 bills through regular order versus 12 bills as, as an omnibus, what do you get that's different? Um, probably you get some different policy outcomes. Is it, um, are they better or worse? I mean, we, we just don't have a good way to answer that. Um, I, I do think that, I mean, I, I started from a position where I always, you know, I very much assume the regular order led to a better legislative process. I've called for what I called managed debate on the Senate floor, which is, um, you know, allow Senate floor managers have a bit more power um, to, to, you know, to, to end debate and determine what kind of amendments can come to the floor because they're not bringing bills to the floor at all right now. Um, if you think about what's happening in the House where they've moved over towards structured rules for appropriations bills, it seems like they're trying to, to walk that line between still having an open process between and not letting it spin out of control. Um, so in, in terms of what that different model looks like, um, I, I'm not sure. We, I mean, we've just started thinking about that, right? But. Um, You know, in terms of whether it include, it always includes open floor debate, I think one important thing to remember about the 50s and 60s is, especially in the Senate, they had a, there was a strong norm that discouraged um, active amending on the floor. I mean, if you were a, a junior senator and you went down to the Senate floor and you offered an amendment to somebody's appropriations bill, I mean, you know, you'd be ostracized. I mean, that, that violated, every, you know, rules of good conduct in the Senate. So it's not like just because something was, was theoretically open to amendment that they all were down there doing it. We've been in this unusual situation where the rules are open, but those norms of restraint have disappeared. And so everybody's been amending. And the, the process couldn't take that. And so uh, how we get to that point where we have some kind of open process on the floor that doesn't spin out of control, I don't think we have the answer to that. I mean, that I think would be ideal, some balance of, of committee and, and restrained open floor debate. But right now, we don't know how to handle that, that floor debate component because it so quickly spins out of control. I think with regard to the, the floor and the norms, particularly the Senate, the process was self-enforcing though, which is the key part. You can't, it's very difficult to impose restrictions on deliberation on people who want to deliberate. I mean, that's just a, I mean, it's just, it's kind of like a fact of life. And so when you take it away from the member and you say, we're going to choose when you can and can't deliberate, it's going to be a difficult thing to do. And you saw, I mean, very quickly in the late fifties, early sixties, you had a bunch of new members came and they're like, well, guess we don't like these bills. Right. I'm just going to amend it on the floor because I can, why not? And then that norm disappeared pretty quickly. Um, I think it just depends, like I said, what are we trying to advantage? If it's the power of the purse, 
right? If you have a separation of powers perspective and you really want to strengthen Congress's ability to, to exercise oversight and compel the executive to do things, well, you probably want a lot of bills. Let's have 100, right? Because then you can put riders on them and it's a lot easier to tie the hands of the executive. If it's about um, kind of a better, more rational appropriations process, you probably want one bill, right? Because you put one big bill on the floor, yeah, it may be a thousand pages, but you got it there for a month, two, three months, just leave it out there. The House, they amend by paragraph, so you kind of get around a lot of the, the kind of chaos. The Senate, it's a little different, but then you can transfer money. I mean, the Budget Act, there's lots of problems right now. If you want to take money out of the CJS bill and put it in the Labor HHS bill, well, that's really hard to do. Like, really hard. Like, I don't even know how you do it. I mean, I guess you could, but um, it, because you don't consider the bills at the same time on the floor. Like, where are you going to put it? In your pocket? Like, you're going to put the money in your pocket and walk around and wait for the labor H bill to come up? Um, and there are all kinds of rules that won't let you put labor H stuff on the CJS bill. I mean, you get the idea. So maybe one bill for a more rational appropriations process. If you want to, um, if you want to kind of silo and protect your own turf, well, you have like two bills, defense, non-defense, or a handful of bills, right? So maybe like these non, you know, defense discretionary programs that Democrats and Republicans like, <clears throat> and then maybe all these other ones they disagree on. And then lastly, if you're trying to look at it more holistically with the authorization process, maybe you get rid of the appropriations committee altogether and go back to a time when they put the appropriations committees as subcommittees, right? Now, the motivation there was a little bit different, but it's still another model. And so I think it gets down to what do you, what are you trying to get? And we haven't had in Congress um, that kind of conversation. And I think even in the academy, that kind of conversation, we just assume that we all agree on what the outcome that we all want, what the good outcome is. And I think there's a lot of variation there. Sam? So I so I'm Sam from Center for Women's Office, and I'm proud of Grinnell College alum. My question is about, it seems, you know, these poison pills and the graphs you showed about poison pills, that some of these extremist members, they are doing it for a press release, but presumably they also believe in what they're doing. So Democrats who wanted to vote on the Confederate flags and VA cemeteries, yeah, they want to Republicans, but like, presumably they also believe that there should not be Confederate flags in gay cemeteries. So it seems like perhaps you get around the poison pill problem by doing committee, pro committee reform, where you don't have all the moderates on appropriations and ways and means, right? There's like one Freedom Caucus member on ways and means. And you, you put all the extremists on the Small Business Committee, and you're like, okay, go play. But then they get, they're blocked out of the process, so then they come to the floor and they say, this is my only option, so I'm going to put these poison pills in because for the rest of the caucus it's poison pills, but for them it's meaningful. Is this, do, like, do either of you guys think that this is a core part of return rate order, reforming the way the committees are selected? And do you know if there is some historical evidence that backs this up? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I think, and I'll turn it over to Peter, but it seems to me that this gets back to like what regular order means. and. <clears throat> Our, I, I disagree to the extent that I don't think our parties are particularly unified right now. And I think that our internal organization of, of, how, of how we organize the House and the Senate are not well equipped to deal with the conflict in the environment given the fact that they're not unified. And I think all of the dysfunction you see is, the, is trying to impose order using a system that is premised on strong, centralized, cohesive parties when they're not. And so you get a little bit more chaos. And so I think, I think you're right to think about what are the kind of broader institutional reforms that need to be made that can accommodate this the conflict in the environment and allow members to try to process that in the best way that they want to and, and uh, that could be one way i mean it, but it, fundamentally you're going to have to grapple with how do you allow members not on a committee to participate in the in the deliberative process in the lawmaking process after the committee stage I and mean, that is a key thing and figuring that out i think really unlocks a lot of the problems that we face right now um, yeah, let me just uh, make a quick point on that. I mean, there there have been points in the in the history of the Appropriations Committee where they've tried to diversify their membership to take into the um, account a, a changing caucus. And I, I think about uh, when in the um, you know 1970s, as the Democratic Party liberalized, one of the things they had to do was try and accommodate the, the larger number of liberal Democrats, and they put them on committees like appropriations and. And then you know the folks who study appropriations say and that's when the mission of the committee started to change, right? That that um, that's when more of those sort of partisan fights started to take over the process, and when it became harder to pass spending bills. So, 
you know, you, I think you can. Um, Sure, you could, you could try and put more of those folks on the Appropriations Committee, and the result would probably be it gets even harder to pass those bills. Right? Um, I, I, th I do think this question of how you handle disagreement on the floor is a really important one, because one person's poison pill, as you said, is, another, is, is, is a, an amendment that somebody else cares deeply about. And uh, you know, with, when the parties are very far apart, there is not a good way on the floor to manage that kind of disagreement. And so the result is that the leaders crack down. Um, I don't think we know what the, the solution to that is. I think we're, we're sort of thinking a lot I mean, about it right now. If they were that far apart, I think that they would just vote down the amendment. I mean, this is the key thing, right? I mean, the, there is a way to deal with disagreement and vote. Nothing produces a definitive outcome like a vote. It's the disconnect between expectations and what the members really believe. And when that disconnect is great, the members don't like to expose it, right? And so that's where I think, because if the, you would let these amendments go because then the majority would just vote them down. Well, James, if I could just jump but, in. I mean, I think one of the places where we disagree here is, is I mean, there's, you know, make this argument that, well, we should just vote, right? The members themselves decide. Um, no, I, they pursue yes. their own, they, they, they pursue their interests as yeah. they see fit. So we can yell at them to vote, right? right? Sorry, I'm not suggesting. Oh, no, 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 right? no, 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 no. We can tell them, vote, you know, go right. vote. And they'll say, well, we don't want to vote. They just won't, right? So I think right. part, of, part of our job is to think about ways to harness you know, reforms to their interests and the way they see them and the way they pursue them, right? Because nothing's going to happen if, if we suggest they do things that but, they fundamentally think are against their but interests. But I think acknowledging that, I mean, the reason why, like, a Confederate flag amendment doesn't get a vote is because half the Republican Party would vote for it. The other half may not like it. Their leadership has to figure out, like, well, which side is the, the bigger half, right? And then they figure, you know, so I agree with that. I mean, there are, um, but, the, but that's not because the parties are so far apart. That's because they're closer together than people think. And when amendments get pushed out or bills get pulled, it's because they're going to pass. You don't pull out a bill for an amendment that's not going to pass, at least in my experience. right? And so I think that's the key thing that we got to recognize. And once you recognize that the parties are no longer as cohesive as we thought they once were, then you, recognize, then you have to get into, well, how do I want to prioritize? What am I trying to get out of this? Maybe it's passing bills. I'm not here to tell you what, what that is. But once you figure that out, then you say, OK, now, how with the reality that we have, the conflict on the outside, and what I want to get out of this, how do we structure a process that gets us that outcome with all of these challenges? And that's the thing that we haven't done. Josh. Um, I wanted to get... Uh, you introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. Uh, Josh Uter, Government Affairs Institute at Georgetown. Um, I wanted to get your opinion on something that hasn't directly been discussed in your paper, but I think is, is very, very connected. And um, one of those things is we're discussing de deliberation as between an open or closed process, right? Um, well, let's not forget that it was closed in the 1940s and 50s for some bills as well, right? You couldn't bring a Ways and Means bill to the floor and open up the entire tax code before 135 members of Congress. I mean, you could, it'd be terrible, right? Um, what but the point is, is there was a limitation in debate, right? Uh, well, yeah, yes. So, um, there was a limitation of debate. I mean, it's been going really well so far. <laughs> <that's why. laughs> they really There's figured it out. There's a limitation of debate uh, that's, been, that's going on, right? And the question is, who's limiting debate? And so the discussion's not really whether it's open or closed, it's who's deciding who gets to deliberate, right? And that's more of a discussion between rank and file of leadership, right? Um, who's controlling who gets a say? Who's controlling who gets an amendment? And I think one of the interesting things about appropriations is that this was a formerly open process that has now recently been completely shut down, right? It started in uh, 2009, 2010 under the Democratic leadership, and then under, again, this past Congress, we brought up appropriations under structured rules, right? So leadership is deciding who gets to have a say. Um, is there anything in your data that suggests that this dynamic is going on in, in either contributing or, or not contributing to debate, quote unquote, as, as you're doing? Um. So I think your, your comment really nicely illustrates that when, we, when we're talking about regular order, we're really talking about redistributing power, right? Because everything you've just described basically describes how power is allocated in Congress, right? And in the 1950s and 60s, it was distributed among uh, committees with a little bit of opportunity for the floor, right? Although, as I just suggested, norms really constrain that. Um, it wasn't as open as it appears. And today, power has been, um, it has been uh, distributed to, to parties, right? And, and they've been pretty centralized. So, um, just lost my train of thought. So, um, how we get back to the, the key part of your question? Sure. Which is just like uh, over the times and the periods where we see appropriations bills come up under structured rules as right. opposed to over and more modern, open, modified, open, or whatever you want to call them. 
Are you seeing distinctions between the types of amendments? Are more extreme members more likely to get an amendment under a structured rule, for example? Oh, so we did do a study. Uh, I did this a couple of years ago of comparing. Um, this was in the 111th Congress, and what happened when the Democrats imposed structured rules, right? And one of the things we observed is that um, it was amendments from more extreme members that were allowed to proceed, at least on the Republican side. So Democrats were in control, and the Republican amendments they allowed to proceed tended to come from more extreme members. And my analysis was they figured those were more likely to fail and more likely to make the Republicans look bad, right? And so those were the ones they brought forward for votes. And I did not observe, uh, as I recall, that pattern, same pattern on the Democratic side. I think there's much less movement. Um, so there is a, a very interesting way parties can manipulate what comes forward using those kind of rules. I mean, you see this on authorization bills all yeah. the time. The reason that I bring it up with appropriations is because this is obviously a very interesting study that kind of teased that out a little bit. But um, I just wondered if you were picking up on some like, similar types of that. Yeah, that's the, that's the place I have. It looks bipartisan. It's just really not. Well, um, yeah, so I, I have to qualify that because there's not a lot of, structured rules are relatively new, so it's not like I can point to a, a big collection of data where I can really get to that problem. Um, but the places where I have, that's the pattern I observed. I want to take one. Uh, do, do a lightning round here. Um, uh, uh, there's three, three people who want to ask questions, and we'll wrap them up in, in, in the lightning round. Um, I thought you did a good job of sort of yeah, introduce yourself. Sorry, with that. Um, sorry, I'm still a CRS even if I'm retired. Um, <laughs> I thought you did a good job of sort of making clear, explicit, what you meant by regular order, and from that way get beyond the you said the really parliamentary uh, definition, the technical definition. Um, but also beyond sort of the intuitive idea that, well, regular order just means the way we were doing it just before I got here. Right, um, yeah. Which, yeah. You know, which is a set of a, um, you know, the, the vague idea of past that we want to return to. Um, but I think you could benefit from more uh, expo exploration of what you mean by deliberation. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about it in terms of, um, uh, Sort of good policy making, but uh, a lot of times on Capitol Hill, especially on the other side of the hill, it is often used to simply mean, uh, well, we took a lot of time, there was a lot of delay. Uh, <laughs> and in uh, public administration studies, it often is used these days seem to mean um, more like uh, getting participation, which is closer to what uh, you were talking about in terms of, and, and one of the questions here earlier was talking about uh, you getting all different views involved. And I'd like to think about it more in terms of essentially involving that kind of exchange of views, that sort of interactive process. But from that point of view, I think, and maybe from all those points of view, there probably aren't any purely procedural solutions to that. You can't have rules that are going to guarantee deliberation. At best, you can have rules that sort of guarantee the possibility of deliberation or facilitate or incentivize deliberation. Um, and that, and then, you know, that may lead you to the question of like, uh, well, do we want to have sort of a structured open process uh, that it, where the process itself is agreed on between the, uh, the parties or the factions or something like that. Um, that might um, that might get you closer to the question of what kind of solution you might or, or response at least that you might want. And obviously, it has to depend to some extent on norms. Um, and I think I'll stop there rather than try harder to make that into a question. At least <laughs> <laughs> respond to it. I think take two more in the last two. Uh, I'm Max with the House Parliamentarian's Office. I was wondering if uh, you could comment on the quality of deliberation uh, of appropriations bills versus budget resolutions, at least in the House. Um, it seems like one of the issues with considering appropriations bills is that in the House, they do paragraph by paragraph. It's an iterative process. Um, 
that seems to open the possibility of poison pills because it's a perfectly reasonable thing for a member to say, I, I don't like this bill, it would need the following 10 discreet amendments to get me to vote for it. I offer those 10 amendments, and seven of them are adopted, three aren't, and so I can say, I'm not voting for this bill anymore. Uh, the way the budget resolutions, at least since the 80s, have been done in the House is that it forces members into these groups, these blocks, that each get behind an amendment in the nature of a substitute that's a complete, a complete budget in and of itself. Everyone is, uh, they're not offering discrete amendments to the budget, but they stand behind an entire substitute for that budget. That seems to be a way to kind of force people or, or stop people from offering poison pill amendments because anyone has to get behind their, their version of the budget. Is that enough deliberation under, is that, is that less, it's, it's less deliberation in a way because there's fewer amendments being offered, but is it still quality deliberation? Is it still good enough? Uh, I'm Jeremy Gerson from Results for America. So um, I appreciate you coming through the day. I think it's helpful. But can I ask you a question? I'll be annoying to be that guy. Like, my ultimate question is do amendments actually really improve legislation, or are they really just designed to give people a chance to talk? So, fair, like, I only lived in the House for two years. I only managed two bills on the floor, and one was a structure rule, and one was on suspension. So, um, but the majority of amendments, including from our side that we even tried to swap down, were not relevant to the major issues in the bill. They were really just a chance for folks to either talk about parochial issues that they cared about in their district, or they were things that were either not, and the things that passed were not terribly controversial. So your data points show that the majority of bills that passed were by voice vote, so that tells me that the majority of amendments that passed under a rule were either not controversial um, or not terribly germane. So again, I sort of come back to, are amendments really, in this day and age, actually helping to improve the, the majority of them? improving legislation, or are they mostly just designed to give members a chance to talk? And that may be fine. That may be actually helping to improve the culture and the sense of deliberation, even if it's not impacting. I'm going to try and touch on each of those? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, all right, that was the e one, right? <laughs> sure. Uh, thank you. That's great. <laughs> uh, Rick, thank you. I, I, I know you've, you've been to a number of my presentations, and I really value your feedback, because I know you know this well. Um, so um, I, real, I, I really like something you said, which is that you, can have, you can't have rules that guarantee deliberation happens, but you can have rules that at least create the possibility of it. Uh, I think I share that view. I think that's what our data suggests, actually, is that um, under some settings, uh, that is precisely what you get. In that, uh, that 2005 example, um, you have what looks like pretty effective deliberating going on bills through an open um, amendment process. In 2016, I think an open amendment process uh, helped, uh, helped the energy and water bill to break down. So it can go either direction, right? And, and I, so I think one of the things we're trying to figure out is, is there a way to steer it one way or the other? And, and that's just something we're puzzling our way through. Um, Max, I don't have a great uh, answer for you on appropriations versus the budget. I haven't done a systematic study of budget resolutions, and, and so I'd just be speculating if I tried to answer you. Um, and then the final question to amendments, improve legislation. Um, so Lee and I are really careful in this paper to say we can't measure quality. Right? Uh, what I can tell you is that amendments certainly will change the policy direction of legislation. And so I think if you, if you look at that 2005 case study example, um, with the Bush administration losing on Amtrak funding, there's a clear shift in policy there. I can't assess that for you, uh, but there are certainly policy consequences to those kind of open amendments. Second, I think your observation about legislating in the last couple of years is um, consistent, I think, with uh, other evidence that suggests we might have moved more, f moved away from the more productive style of debate we saw in the earlier part of the time period I study and more toward position taking. Um, we haven't done the kind of content analysis to really validate that that's what's going on, but I, I, that's my intuition. Mm -hmm.